All right, so <clears throat> I would like to pick up our computation of the two-point correlation function that we started the last time by way of recalling what we were doing. Just remember, we're trying to calculate correlation functions, right? The correlation functions have lots of physical interpretations depending on the system that you're working with, but ultimately they tell you how parts of the system um, behave. They tell you about the dynamics. They tell you about the way the system interacts or self-interacts. So these are the fundamental observables in a quantum theory, and that's why it's important to calculate them. Generally, calculating the correlation functions in the quantum theory is hard, right? <clears throat> For those of you that are doing the quantum field theory course, you could probably appreciate how hard it is um, to calculate it. Um, there are many different ways you can calculate correlation functions. The most efficient method to calculate the correlation function is through the path integral, which is also in Feynman diagrams, and you have to calculate all the Feynman diagrams. Um, you know, people have built careers on calculating Feynman diagrams and working out efficient ways to calculate Feynman diagrams. The point here that I'm trying to make is that um, in a conformal field theory, the system is so highly constrained by the symmetry that in many cases, these correlation functions are entirely fixed. Or if they're not entirely fixed, then most of the correlation function is, most of the form of the correlation function is fixed. Right? This is a huge simplification um, of the problem. And in fact, we showed just using symmetry, and in fact, just using um, dilatations and translations, that we could fix the one point function. Now, admittedly, that was a trivial calculation, but nevertheless, um, we could argue that the form of the, not only the form, the actual one point function itself for any conformal field theory in any dimension is zero, it has to be, okay? Then I started the calculation on the two point function. And the two point function is the propagator of the theory, right? So understanding what the two point function does tells you a lot about a lot of things. So we saw in the last, um, um, lecture that applying translation, applying translation, uh, translational symmetry to the two point function fixed the form of the two point function to be the following. So we're calculating correlation functions of primary operators. And in this case, we'll take two primary operators with different scaling dimensions, delta one and delta two, located at x1 and x2. And we calculate their two-point correlator. And we saw that the two-point correlator um, is some function of x1 and x2. And translational symmetry fixed that the form of this, that however this function depends on x1 and x2, it could only depend on it as the difference between these two points. Okay, this was because um, when we took this guy and put it into the water identity with, trans with translational symmetries, the water identity resulted in a differential equation and the differential equation told us that the derivative of this guy with respect to x1 must be minus the derivative with respect to x2, which necessarily means that it can only be some function because it takes in two numbers and it produces one number um, must be of this form. Okay, all right. <clears throat> So that's what translations, translational symmetry brought us. What about rotational symmetry? So rotational symmetry, technically I, I mean here um, invariance under Lorentz transformations, or if we go to the Euclidean picture, these Lorentz transformations are just rotations. So now let's imp implement The Lorentz symmetry, or Lorentz transformation. X mu to X mu tilde, where X mu tilde is L mu nu X nu. Uh, okay, sorry, let's be a little more consistent and call this lambda mu nu, where the lambda mu nu is a Lorentz transformation matrix. Okay. 
So in this case, we go to the word identities in the form for finite transformations. So that the word identity means that the following is true. It says that O delta one of X one, O delta two of X two is equal to the two point function of O delta one. I'm dropping indices for convenience, lambda inverse of X one, O delta two, lambda inverse of x2. Or equivalently, in terms of the functional form that we already found for the two-point function, it says that f of x1 minus x2 must be the same as f of lambda inverse x1 minus x2. Let's call this two. So this is the statement that applying a rotation or a Lorentz transformation has no effect on the two-point function. Okay? I make a rotation of the two-point function and it has no effect. It's the same two-point function f of x1 minus x2. Which means that you know whatever this functional dependence is on the distance between on the difference between these two events in space time, it can only depend on the distance between these two events in space time. Okay? So this means that F of x1 minus x2 must be f of mod x1 minus x2, where this mod f x1 minus x2 is the Lorentz invariant distance between the events x1 and x2. So this is the square root of x1 minus x2 mu, x1 minus x2 mu downstairs. Okay. So the upshot here is that after impl after implementing rotations or Lorentz transformations, we find that the two point function must have the form some function of mod x1 minus x2. Okay. So now let's do dilatations. So again, I want to use the finite form of the water identities, which tells us that, um, which will tell us that under a scaling where x goes to lambda x, the two point function O delta one of x one, O delta two of x two must be lambda to the delta one, O delta one of uh, lambda x one, lambda to the delta two, O delta two of lambda x two. Which is just 
Lambda. To the delta one plus delta two times the two point function. Or, in other words, that in terms of this function f here, that f of lambda mod x1 minus x2 is lambda to the minus delta 1 plus delta 2 f of mod x1 minus x2. So how do we, let's see. So how do we interpret this constraint? So this constraint we said, basically, if we made a rotation um, in space and time, then this didn't have any impact on this function f, which necessarily means that f must be a function of the, dis the distance between those two points, right? So it was easy enough to interpret. What does this mean? Well, to see what this means, let's make a Taylor expansion. Um, so I'm going to Taylor expand this function um, f as follows uh, mod x1 minus x2 as the sum over n equals naught to infinity sum set of constants, coefficients, Cn mod x1 minus x2 uh, to the n. Right. I'm abusing notation here because you know differentiating absolute value functions is problematic, but we understand that we're talking about some distance. So you can always go to our polar, what's it called? Um, radius argument form and we're expanding in the radius, okay? <clears throat> so then if we substitute this, if we substitute this constraint into this expansion, it follows that, so from equation four, it follows that the sum over n of Cn lambda to the n mod x1 minus x2 to the n plus equal to lambda to the minus delta 1 plus delta 2 sum over n Cn mod x1 minus x2 to the end. And this equation, let's call it phi, is only satisfied for all lambda if the Cn are zero for all n except when n is minus delta one plus delta two. So equation five is satisfied all lambda if and only if n is minus delta one plus delta two. In other words, over all of the um, over all of the actually sorry, this is not n equals zero to infinity. This is this is a Laurent expansion, so I should. Just say expand in the power series, okay? So this is only satisfied when N is minus delta one plus, um, plus delta two.
And then we'll pick that CN and we'll just set it equal to some constant C. So this means that my function F of mod X1 minus X2 is just some constant C divided by mod X1 minus X2 to the delta one plus delta two. Okay. This constant C actually just sets the normalization of our fields and we can always choose things such that the normalization is set to one. So this is a normalization. So this sets the normalization of our fields. We can always set C equal to one. <clears throat> so what we found here is that what we found here is that if we put this together, then the two-point function is one over mod x1 minus x2 to the delta one plus delta two. Right. Again, this is the propagator for the theory. So this you would you would solve for by calculating the Green's functions associated to the to the system that you're working with, right? To the CFT. It's a non-trivial task if you try to calculate it using the path integral. Okay. Just implementing three out of the four um, symmetries of the theory we more or less fix the form of this two-point function, okay? It says that wherever these guys are located, the two-point function has to be a function of the distance between those two points in space-time. And it only depends on the um, scaling dimensions of the operators, delta one and delta two in this form. Turns out we can actually do better because we still have one more symmetry to implement. Representations. So let's ask what does special conformal transformations buy us in terms of fixing this two point function? <clears throat> well, the problem with special conformal transformations is implementing it directly is a bit of a mess. Right? However, we know that a special conformal transformation is really a sequence of an inversion, a translation, and another inversion. We know what translations do. Translations have already been implemented and they've fixed the, the form of the two-point function. So we only need to know what happens under inversions, okay? Once we understand what happens under inversions, then we understand what happens under special conformal transformations. And what we're asking now is, does this further constrain the, the problem? Okay. So, to understand um, the effect of special conformal transformations on the two-point function. We only need to know how inversions act.
So recall, under an inversion, the point x mu goes to x mu tilde, and x mu tilde is x mu over x dot x. And we also learned that the Jacobian of this transformation, dx tilde by dx, is just 1 over x tilde to the d. And what this meant was that scalar primaries transform as follows, O delta um, O tilde delta of x tilde was lambda, uh, sorry, x tilde squared to the minus delta O delta of x, okay? We're going to need one more mathematical identity. Actually, let me, okay. So, putting this into the ward identity again, this tells us that O delta one of X one tilde, O delta two X two tilde is one over X one tilde squared to the delta one over X two tilde squared to the delta two O of um, X one O X two. Now I need an identity. And that's a simple identity that you can prove. Namely that if x1, sorry, if that if x and x tilde are related like this, then the following must be true. One over x1 minus x2 squared is x1 tilde squared x2 tilde squared over x1 tilde minus x2 tilde squared. Um, I'm going to call this 6, 4, 7, and we'll call this Eight. All right, that's just a mathematical identity. If I have x tilde and x related by inversion, then just by playing around with the x's, you can show that this must be true. And I'm going to need to use that to write this in a better form. So what this means is that, so eight in seven,
tells me that x1 tilde squared to the delta 1 times x2 tilde squared to the delta 2 all divided by x1 tilde minus x2 tilde um, squared. to the delta one plus delta two over two. Must equal to one over x one minus x two squared to the delta one plus delta two over two. Okay. But I know that if I take H here and directly raise both sides to the delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2, then I'll find that Sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad. This is not from 8 and 7. This comes from this comes from, from this. So the statement here is that um, I take this to this side of the equation, and that gives me the numerator. And I know that this can be written as that because all I have to do is replace the, I know the form, the functional form of the two point function and replace the x's with the x tilde's. Um, and it's being raised, well, there's a, I write this as the square root of a square, okay? So from, this is from six. Uh, so six in seven gives me this. But from eight, If I raise both sides of eight to the delta one plus delta two over two, then I know that um, x one tilde to the delta one plus delta two over two is one tilde squared. Yeah, uh, delta one plus delta two over two x two tilde squared to the delta one plus delta two over two over x one tilde minus x two tilde squared to the delta one delta two over two is equal to one over x one minus x two squared to the delta one plus delta two over two. Just raising left and right side by delta one plus delta two over two. Right. Um, so if I compare the left hand side and right hand side of these two last two equations. So let's call this nine and 10. Then I see that that constant one, that, sorry, that constant C is only non zero. And when it's non zero, we can set it to one by the argument that I just made about the, the fact that it sets the normalizations. If and only if delta one and delta two are the same. So comparing
9 and 10 implies that delta 1 must equal to delta t. So this is what special conformal transformations tell us. So now we can put all, all the information that we have together. And say, finally, that the two-point function of two primary operators, O delta 1 and x1, O delta 2 and x2, must be delta, conica delta of delta 1 plus delta 2 over mod x1 minus x2 to the delta 1 plus delta 2. And that's it. Completely fixes, the symmetries of the problem completely fixes the two-point function. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And the symmetries of the problem completely fix the value of the two-point function propagated the Green's function of this theory in terms of the conformal dimensions of the primary operators. Okay, so this is a pretty big deal actually. So um, the two-point function is completely fixed once we know the primary scaling dimensions. Unfortunately, these scaling dimensions are still generally complicated functions of the coupling of the theory. And in order to compute these guys in general, you have to calculate Feynman diagrams, right? But once you have them, you don't have to do any more work. The two-point function is completely known, okay? Now, the scaling dimensions are the dimensions of the quantum operators. Classically, these scaling dimensions are the engineering dimensions of the operators. We'll do a couple of examples. And in fact, I did one example already in which I showed you how you use dimensional analysis to figure it out. But in general, you use dimensional analysis together with the bound and the scaling dimensions to determine A, what the, what the dimensions of your operator are, and B, whether the operator is a primary operator or not, right? must saturate the, the bound on the operators. But when you quantize the theory, these dimensions pick up corrections from the quantization. These are called anomalous, uh, these are called anomalous scaling dimensions. And it's the anomalous scaling dimensions that are difficult to compute and in general, a function of the couplings of the theory, okay? So that's the first point to note. The second point to note is that the two-point function um, has a power law fall off with the distance between the two points, right? So this is telling you how these two points, are, how these operators are correlated as you change these two points. And what you're finding from that, just from the symmetries, is that the correlations between these operators drops off, okay? The further you take these two operators away from each other, you expect them physically to be less correlated with each other. So think in terms of, you know, the spins in a in a in a ferromagnet, for example, right? I expect that 
this spin has less of an influence on this spin, right? This magnetic moment has less of an of an impact on this magnetic moment, the further apart they are, okay? That makes perfect sense. However, what it's telling you is that the drop-off is power law. It goes like some power of the distance between these two, okay? This power law fall off of the two point function is a smoking gun for scale invariant theory. This is how scale invariant theories behave. You calculate their propagators and you'll find that it drops off um, like a power law. So then I should contrast this with what happens if you're not in a scale invariant theory, right? One way to break the scale invariance, to break the conformal invariance um, of our theory in two dimensions, those are the same thing, um, was to give the fields in the theory a mass. Right. So what happens if you give the fields in the theory of mass? Well, if you give the fields in the theory of mass, then what you find is an exponential drop off that goes like e to the mass times the distance between the two points. So take a note of this. The power law fall off. of the two-point function is characteristic of a conformal field theory or a scale invariant theory. For contrast, in a massive, um, in a theory with massive particles, which the massive part, the presence of these massive particles break the scale invariance because the mass set the scale for the theory. The two-point function is phi of x1, phi of x2. We'll go like e to the minus m times the distance between x1 and x2. And this number m, the scale of the lightest particle and the, the mass of the lightest particle in the spectrum of the theory, um, determines what's called the correlation length. So the correlation length um, is one over the mass. So if the mass goes to zero, the correlation length goes to infinity. And if the correlation length goes to infinity, that tells us that um, the theory is scale invariant. Okay. This is called the correlation length. And fields that are within a correlation length of each other tend to be correlated and those further away are, non, uh, are not correlated. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, Ten minutes. All right, let's let's stop here today. <laughs> Sajid will be completely confused.
What do you know? Keep going. I'm, also, I'm listening. 